Hi, everybody. I'm Bob Bowman, Editor-in-Chief of Supply Chain Brain, and I want to welcome you to this presentation on Digital Twinning and AI for Warehouse Optimization, presented by Texas. Quick reminder, there will be an audience question and answer session at the end of this presentation. Audience members are encouraged to submit their questions at any time during the presentation by clicking on that Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. So what is a digital twin? And how does it combine with artificial intelligence to optimize warehouse decision-making? Today, we're gonna to learn how the combination of these technologies improves visibility, efficiency, and overall warehouse operations. We'll navigate through some real-world case studies, pioneering solutions, and effective strategies to tackle implementation hurdles. With that, I wanna introduce our speakers for today. Bill Denby is Vice President of Global Trade Management Strategy with Texas. Bill is an all-around supply chain expert with a special focus on logistics management systems. He advocates for customer experience excellence and supply chain solutions that stress accessibility and ease of use. Joe Vernon is Principal of Emerging Technology Business Consulting with EPAM Systems. With more than 25 years of experience as a supply chain transformation expert covering multiple industries, Joe specializes in supply chain processes, technology, and strategy. Prior to joining EPAM, Joe led multiple AI and analytics-enabled supply chain transformation roadmap assessments and proof-of-concept engagements for Fortune 100 companies. Pranav Bardwaj is Senior Manager of Supply Chain Network Optimization, Strategy, and Supply Chain with Deloitte. A career consultant with over a decade of global consulting experience, he is the national leader for emerging technologies in logistics and distribution, while also leading the marine transportation vertical for the supply chain simultaneously. With that, let's get into the panel portion of our presentation here. I've got all of our speakers here. Welcome, everybody. Great to have you all. I'm going to open up with a basic question that we're going to need to help guide us through this entire presentation. I'm going to direct it to Bill. Bill, what exactly is a digital twin? Okay, so I think a lot of us understand that digital twin is a term that's been kicked around a lot lately. Um, <clears throat> but in effect, a digital twin is essentially a highly detailed digital model of a real world system or a real world process. So you think of it as a kind of a bridge between the physical and the digital world. So it's a model created by gathering data from sensors or systems embedded in, in the real world. And these can be anything from a machine in a warehouse to an entire supply chain network. And these sensors, they, they, they collect the physical system data in real time and from various aspects such as location or, or temperature or speed or, or anything that's relevant to, the, to what you're trying to model. And then you feed it into a digital model. And that is continuously updated from those sensors to reflect the current state of that real world system. And what it means is that the digital twin mirrors and evolves alongside the physical counterpart of the, the, the physical uh, aspect of the, that, you're, that you're mirroring. And it, it allows you to take a look at the status, condition, performance, everything of, of whatever it is that you're, that you're, you're mapping to. So I guess the question is why? Why would you even want a digital twin? What's the value of it? And what it allows you to do is it allows you to take that, that digital twin and change it in ways that you couldn't do to the physical, uh, the, the physical world. You can, you can expand it by 20% and see what happens. Or you could, you know, you could create uh, digital roadblocks and see what happens to that to that uh, to that uh, digital twin. In effect, mirroring or modeling what what a, what would happen in the physical world. It's used for things like predict predictive maintenance and problem solving, um, simulation and planning. So you can run simulations on the digital twin. To, to reflect the changes, how they, they would affect in the real world. And also it's used often in training and education. Why not create a digital twin of something and let someone learn how to navigate that before they're getting into the physical aspect of, of, of whatever it is that you're, uh, you're, you're mirroring. So it's a dynamic virtual representation of a physical system. 
uh, used to simulate, predict, and optimize real-world process and operations. And I think we're seeing more and more of them in the real world today. And uh, we're gonna, we are going to continue to see more and more as systems continue to be able to um, get more and more powerful and really model so many aspects of, of, the, uh, of the physical world. And also the, 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 uh, the capability of us being able to access sensors and data um, uh, are increasingly um, uh, available to us. So uh, it's uh, it's definitely something we're going to see more and more of, and and they're going to be embedded in many different types of systems. Thanks. Yeah, the idea of being able to conduct these so-called "what if" scenarios is so powerful. Yeah. Thanks for that, Bill, for that great definition. Joe, I'd like to ask you though to apply the concept of a digital twin more specifically to a warehouse or supply chain environment. How does it work there? Sure. Thank you. Um, Playing on what Bill said about additional data that comes in from sensors, et cetera. You've really, what you're building with a digital twin is a great management and planning tool. So you're looking at things more discreetly. You're kind of more closely monitoring your equipment, the conditions of your product, the rate of work of your equipment, the speed of your equipment, how your workforce is moving within a building. You've got, you've got this new level of visibility and this creates these data points. Now, what do you do with these data points? Well, you put them in a predictive model, and that's really the, the second piece of the digital twin is not only the all the all the new data you have to source and create because you're trying to do a mirror, a digital mirror of the actual operation, but then the predictive modeling that helps that helps you um, foresee a disruption that might be happening or or look at a variance and try to respond to it. So really, for a practical inside the warehouse or in a supply chain environment, it's a management and planning tool. So if I see that I've got a heavy load tomorrow coming into my warehouse, I want to know what the factors are that might affect my ability to complete those orders. And those factors may be weather. They may be that my, my workforce absenteeism rate has been, has been running at a rate that I'm not used to. It may be that my, some of my equipment's going to go down for predictive maintenance. There's so many new variables that you're putting into your models based on a digital twin that you're really giving managers a better look at the reality. That, that, that's the good stuff from Digital Twin. And then, like you said, on simulations, you can say, well, what's tomorrow going to be like? Oh, tomorrow's actually going to be a heavy labor day. I didn't really expect that much. So I better, I better prepare for overtime or call extra people in. So it's a simulation tool to help you manage better. It's watching your operation in real time. And you're really looking at things like you're just trying to predict if you're a warehouse manager, am I going to get everything shipped? Am I going to get my work done? The other thing about it is it's about the risk, right? You're trying to avoid risk and disruption. So the practical application of it inside your supply chain is you're looking at data points, you're more closely monitoring things, and you're looking for things that are going to cause you not to make your deadlines, not to make your SLAs, not to ship a product on time. Where are my risks? What can go wrong? And help me keep help me keep out in front of that. That's the beauty of the digital twin. It's an extra level of extra level of management and planning. It's really a great tool. Pranav, let me bring you into this uh, to this conversation too. As we know, of course, the concept of a digital twin isn't exactly new. Some version of it has been around for for a long time. Maybe not specifically in the warehouse environment. But what do you feel? Maybe you could tell us more about your idea of a digital twin. In addition to what is driving renewed interest in it right now. Absolutely, uh, Bob. And I'd just like to cap, actually recap what Bill and Joe just said. So a digital twin, the way we think of it is where there's some sort of a synchronization, a simulation and a visualization. Um, and, and as you said, digital twin has been around for a while, but it has been around in perhaps a more infant stage, what we call um, you know, a level one digital twin in its uh, maturity spectrum, which would be something like a building information model. So, you know, I've got plugs, I've got bulbs and tubes and, you know, just understanding what's the energy consumption in a warehouse. That was probably the, the most primary sort of digital twin that we had. And then we've defined further levels of maturity, which go on from um, a static digital twin to dynamic digital twin and the first three levels, which are you know static engineering, static digital twin, and dynamic digital twin, they don't affect the reality as it is. So you get information from the physical world and you you simulate it and you visualize it as 
uh, Bob, uh, Bill and Joe just, just told us. And then you have a live digital twin and an autonomous digital twin. So in order to get to that live digital twin or, or the autonomous digital twin, we, we needed a fair bit of advancement in technology and, and with the pro proliferation of internet of things and advancement in big data analytics, it's, it's actually become possible for us to go into a realm where I can move things on a screen and that actually affects reality. So a lot of it has actually come down to the increased computational power to, to handle the complex simulation and analyses required for digital twin along with the integration in, in machine learning and AI um, that, that has opened up new possibilities for predictive maintenance, real-time decision-making and enhanced uh, simulation capabilities. That coupled with, um, I guess, the, the broadening of the horizon of digital twins. Uh, back in the day, it was mostly thought that digital twin is most applicable for the manufacturing industry or, or perhaps in construction and transportation. But now, and, and especially the folks at Texas know this better than anybody else, uh, there's been uh, involvement of digital twins in, in healthcare, in urban planning, energy management. So I think it's it's all of this that has been um, advanced through the, the development that we've made in AI, in machine learning, in just overall computational technologies, and then um, over the last four years, I think the two biggest things on everybody's agenda has been um, sustainability and, and efficiency. And then what do we do if we have, um, you know, a second pandemic and how do we run our businesses in a manner that they don't come to a grinding halt? And I think these all factors combined um, have, have, have provided that push to digital twins and AI and digital twins in warehouses. Yeah. Yeah, I think I'd like to just jump in and... and put uh, something that, uh, that, that that Joe mentioned earlier, which is this whole idea of, okay, I'm sitting in my warehouse, I've got a backlog of orders, can I finish my orders? Am I going to get to go home on time today? <laughs> or at and, all. <laughs> yeah, or at all. Yeah, um, in the old days, what we used to do is we used to say, oh, well, let's run three months backlog of, of productivity, and we'll average that out, and we'll say, oh, well, well, our normal pick rate is X and we've got this many outstanding lines and yeah, we'll probably do it okay. Well, with a digital twin, the difference is you can now do that based upon actually the real orders in your well and actually the real people you have on your floor at this moment in time and how they're performing. And I think that's the nuance that a lot of people miss where it's tightened up the accuracy of your ability to predict whether you're going to go home on time. It's it's tightened it up because it's basic, basing it on data that's managed in real time, that's able to, to really say, well, you know, the, the, the guys on the floor are, 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 are like smashing it today. We're going to be finishing early. Maybe we could bring some more orders down or, or whatever. But it's today that it's basing it on, not three months worth of history that we average out and try, try to make a guess on, on how it's going to go. I think that's the nuance that's really that uh, the, the managers that I talk to are really sort of seeing value out of when it comes to the, the, where the, the digital twin really meets the road kind of thing. That's a great point. The ability to avoid death by averaging, you know, there's the old, the old saying, you can drown in water that's an average of two feet deep. <laughs> so this is a, I, I love the, the real time aspect of that. Yeah. But, you know, let's do an audience poll. Let's let's uh, we we'd love to know uh, how you folks out there are using digital twins these days. And so we'd like you to answer this question right now. Do you use digital twin technology in your warehouse? And here are your four choices. Yes. <laughs> Step number two, no and no plans to do so. Three, no, but part of our future strategy. And finally, no and still exploring. So please uh, just uh, check in with us on which of those four choices best describes your use or not use of digital twin technology in your warehouse right now. We'll pull that. We'll give you a few seconds to answer. There's no right or wrong answer. It's what you, our guys, are experiencing, and that will help us really to understand uh, a lot about uh, how the folks out there are, are responding to this technology. Okay, this is coming up. All oh, right. Well, interesting. 
Interesting. Boy, you guys, uh, here, yeah, you got your work cut out for you because 48%, our majority here, said no and still exploring. 27% said no, but part of future strategy. 17% coming in third said no and no plans to do so. And finally, 8% said yes. So a lot of work to be done on that. Thank you, audience, for uh, for uh, sharing that with us. So uh, let's move on and talk. I want to ask Bill, you know, it's obvious that to create a digital twin, data is needed, it's necessary. Where can that data initially come from in a warehouse environment? Yeah, well, well thanks. Um, I think data is key. And in a warehouse management setting, it's data that drives the digital twin. And it comes from a variety of sources. And I think one of the one of the points before I talk about that is really, really important is understanding um, that these the accessibility to this data is now really transforming our ability to do this. That didn't used to be the case where you could pull data from disparate sources and integrate it together. That's starting to become much easier to do. And that's allowing us to do this. So Sources like sensors and IOTs, and I think I think uh, you know Joe mentioned that they're really often the backbone of data collection in a modern warehouse. You know, uh, they, they they might be monitoring things like forklifts or conveyor belts, and they track movement, usage, temperature, uh, humidity, all manner of different things like that. And um, and and these IOT devices, um, they can track. You can actually tag it, actual inventory or high value inventory. We do that a lot in healthcare with high value items, um, have their own personal RFID tag, and that tracks the life, the life cycle of these things. Um, but uh, what it does is it gives you a, a vision, a visibility of inventory in real time. You know, where is it and how many do you have? Um, condition of goods. Awesome things like that. So that's your sensors and IoT. And one of the interesting things, I, 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 I'll, I'll let Joe jump in on this later on, but I think one of the key things is, this, is the cost of those devices and the, the, uh, the complexity of them have come down immensely over the last few years. Finally, uh, secondly, there's the WMS. And you know the WMS is really a key part of your modern warehouse. And that's collecting information about all the activity that's occurring in there in the warehouse, and it's it's obviously tracking the the, the workers that are equipped with with, uh, with uh, uh, scanners and and such like. And the other thing is order is the WSs are also starting to drive automation. So if you've got any kind of warehouse automation, the volume of data that can come into your WMS from the warehouse automation and then flow through to your digital twin is exponential. Um, you almost have to decide how how little to take because you can you can gather so 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 much. So so automation through the WMS is is often coming into the digital twin, and then finally um, you've got external data sources, um, supply chain partners updating you on expected uh, time of arrival for deliveries or transportation schedules or uh, potential. Uh, uh, slowdowns or conflicts or things like that. So the key thing is taking those sources of data and combining them into a single cohesive uh, group that you can then use to model on. And that's that's really what we're seeing. So I think that's the, the criticality of it. It's the not just where's the data coming from, but it's the integration into a uh, into a data pool that can be actually utilized. I wonder also if the digital twin can be a particular value. You know, you're talking, uh, Bill, about the WMS, but as we know, modern day warehouses have multiple systems. They have what was a warehouse control system becoming a warehouse execution system. You have labor, labor management system. You have order management systems. You have all this stuff going on. Can the digital twin be a value because it incorporates data from all those sources and, and in a coherent fashion and, and kind of an overview of the entire operation? Absolutely. I mean, that's the key to it, right? As you're bringing in these sources, but of course, winnowing out only the relevant information, yeah. you know, the things that matter to solve the problem that you're trying to solve. Now, you have got to be very careful about, you know, modeling the whole world. You know, it's uh, this whole Gaia project here. Can we create an entire, it, it, that's just too complex. So um, you, you, when we're talking in the real world, it's generally you'll you'll tighten it down to bringing in data that's relevant specifically to the problem you're trying to solve at that moment in time. 
Mm -hmm. Joe, maybe you can tell us a little bit more. I know Bill referenced these uh, the sensors and the cameras that tie into IoT systems today. Can you talk more about the other methods of collecting additional data, the different ways that that's happening in the warehouse right now? Sure, and I do want to I do want to do a follow on comment to what was stated before. We're, sure. we're finding some we're finding some interest and some applicability to sort of having a twin to twin to twin conversation, right? So a twin that's running your warehouse, maybe a twin that's running your order management. That's I not see. out of the realm of possibility. They each they each optimize what they do specifically, and one's output becomes the input to the other. I think from a future looking perspective, that's the kind of construct you might see architecturally that there'd be multiple twins running, specializing in what they do, and their outputs can be inputs for other models. That's a pretty exciting frontier. But let's talk about sensors and and devices and things that can create the data you need to feed the you need to feed the digital twin. And I want to, and I want to talk very practically. So you get inside of a warehouse, and I think one of the daunting things when you start talking about IoT is, geez, I got to get a bunch of hardware and stuff. It's going to be expensive. But you can find that just adding some light sensors, and these light sensors are very inexpensive. Some are just ten dollars, and they're and they're pretty rigorous, and they connect via a cell a cell connection. Just putting a, a light sensor by a door so you can watch how many times the forklift goes in and out of a truck and what its cadence is. Or go up the next level and GPS track all your forklifts so you can watch their continuous flow through the warehouse and know exactly where they are. And not just that they started at point A and got to point B, you know, in 90 seconds, but know, but know where they are at all times. Did they stop? Did they take a detour? These kind of data points are, are very, very enriching. And we know now in trucks that They've added temperature sensors and vibration sensors to, to worry about spoilage or breakage while, while goods are in progress. So the price has gone down, the connectivity has gone down. And the other thing that's exciting about it is you can take that data and now you can do machine learning analytics right there on the edge. So you don't have to push all of it to the cloud, which those of you who are getting into this will realize that moving data in and out of the cloud is where you get the transaction fees. So you can mm -hmm. actually capture that data locally, physically at on site, push it to an edge device right there, do do your initial scrubbing of the data or, or analytics before you feed it to your digital twin, or even let the let the predictive computation happen right there. And that's what Bill is alluding to. The price of all this has really come down. And then you'd be surprised with things like computer vision. A uh, $300 camera can do a lot of good for you. And also people can dual purpose their own security cameras to not only be a security camera, but to do something for the operation. So if you're thinking about it, if you're thinking about, if, if it looks daunting to you, really, really think in more simple terms about some simple sensors, some simple devices, some some inexpensive cameras to get started. And and that that's a pretty exciting, uh, that's a pretty exciting prospect. Again, which five or 10 years ago was not available at a very reasonable cost. Pranav, maybe you can ch chime in here with your ideas about uh, about how data is best managed and how to tell the uh, valuable data from the stuff you don't need and and how to avoid being completely overwhelmed by data. I mean, this falls into the category, be careful what you wish for when warehouses say, gee, I wish I had more data. Well, you got it now, folks. So what do you do with it? Uh, do you, how, how do you how do you address that challenge, Pranav? Yeah, I guess it's very easy to get sucked into the the storm of, you know, I've got all of this data, let me model everything and then figure out what I'm doing. And, you know, next thing you know, you're going down a rabbit hole where you don't quite know what you're doing. Yeah. Um, I, I guess the answer lies in just taking bite-sized chunks. So, you know, what part of the warehouse do you actually want to optimize using the digital twin? And, you, you know, one piece of data that, that I do want to mention that, you know, we've seen certain of our clients use is actually um, dock door availability from computer vision or cameras. So while while inside of the warehouse or inside of the four walls, as we like to call it, that's being managed by WMS and all of the other things. What happens to all those uh, trucks and containers coming in during Christmas? And there are you know now forty containers lined out, and I don't know where to you know get them in through which dock door and how to bring the merchandise inside. So I think it's um, the, the first question that the businesses need to answer is that what is it that they're looking to solve using the digital twin? And if the uh, problem is big enough where you can actually get the ROI and it's not an overkill, because um, even though these sensors and, and um, a lot of the hardware is cheap, at the end of the day, it's still money and you need to justify the business case around it. So, 
So that would be, I guess, number one is figuring out what's the problem that we are looking to solve. And then at least what, what we've seen, seen in our experience is, um, you know, real time tracking of inventory and just in, in improved um, inventory management or accuracy of stock to, to reduce overstocking or, or stockouts. Um, that's been one of the biggest um, use cases that we are seeing uptake in when it comes to digital twin. The second one is around um, efficient space utilization. You know, we've got all of this data around um, which of my slots were empty or, you know, I picked out of this slot on, let's say, 24th of Jan. And then when was the next time I filled that slot out, especially in very, very large uh, warehouses, you, you might just not use the space as efficiently as you think. And, you know, it always takes me back to um, Christmas time, um, Christmas and New Year. I think it's it's fun for pretty much everybody except for people working in warehouses or supply chain. So that's really what I'm looking to um, reduce the pain on when when I'm thinking of digital twins and, and AI in digital twin. And eventually also understanding that um, automation has changed a lot um, over the last 10 years. It used to be about conveyor belts and carousals. And now we're talking about automated robots picking up um, you know, merchandise from anywhere in the warehouse, especially if you see some of the really large e-com retailers that have started developing their own technologies. Um, so it, it all comes down to, yes, I have the data, but what is the problem that I'm looking to solve? Is it meaty enough? And is it actually going to deliver business benefits when, when I actually do it? And then finally also, you know, I think this thing gets underclubbed a lot is what's the change management effort I'm looking at? Because at the end of the day, if if the people operating the warehouse and, and if your labor cannot live in harmony with that kind of technology, perhaps that's not the best pilot and maybe we should choose something that's relatively lighter that allows people to understand what digital twins are and then take them on a long journey of um, automating as much as you can. Because at the end of the day, um, what matters to a business is is cost efficiency um, and then the sustainability of those processes and technology. Well, Pranav, no discussion of data and analytics today happens without also referencing AI, artificial intelligence. How can we use this data in combination with AI to support digital twins and warehouse optimization? Uh, absolutely right. So uh, I, I would even take it a, a step further and say that with the advent of Gen AI, you already have certain simulation capabilities that are being provided to you. Um, I, and, and one of the examples that comes to my mind is that if uh, I have these certain blocks of spaces in a warehouse that I know are probably not emptying enough, uh, emptying themselves uh, quickly enough then what sort of problems am I going to run uh, by the time it's crunch time? Again, going back to the Christmas examples, um, if, if my warehouse is full or close to capacity or 80% full or 70% full, and I'm expecting a lot of merchandise to come in, now I can actually model that scenario as to what is it going to look like? Am I going to have enough space um, inside my warehouse to accommodate uh, the merchandise that's coming in? That's one. And the second one is how much labor do I actually need to efficiently process all of the merchandise that's in my in my warehouse? And then what are the implications of that downstream, be it uh, transportation or be it rest of my network? So I, I think that simulation and that predictive capability um, was lacking, and and you know it's been lacking in in, in pretty much all the WMS systems that are out there, and and. It, integrating a digital twin into, into a WMS would provide you that capabilities of pretty much predicting whatever it is that you want to predict. And then in, in certain cases, again, um, Bill, Bill already spoke to it. And, and I've seen this in my experience that we've had high value inventory lying around in a warehouse somewhere. Where? <laughs> we don't know, but it's there. And it, it can quickly amount up to you know a sizable amount and and that that sort of uh, tracking if you have an RFID on a on a relatively high value object you can figure it out where it is in the system or at least where was it last seen in your system and as a result what's the corresponding physical location of that uh, that 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 good in in the warehouse so those are some of the things where we can bring in the data that we already have from from our past uh, operations 
and meld that together with AI and digital twin to deliver business benefits. Um, I'd just like to add um, an area which I have been surprised about, but we are seeing AI really applied heavily in um, in in warehouses is around uh, data cleansing. Believe it or not, it's 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 the bane of every warehouse guy or supply chain guys uh, or gals' pro, uh, uh, life is bad data. Is like, well, the dimensions on the product are wrong, or I've got the same product in my warehouse with two different names on it, and some of it's called this, and some of it's called that, and I can't find either of them, uh, and so on and so on. And so, um, and, and often data, bad data, is the death of an implementation project, because you end up with, uh, you know, with trying to put stuff away that won't fit or or whatever. And um, AI is wonderfully uh, uh, designed for cleaning up item masters or cleaning up location masters and and making sure to highlight. Um, it, it, potential problems. So we, we actually have a, a, an aspect to our solution where it goes through the item master and says, these ones are okay. These ones here, you might just want to take a look at. I'm about 80% sure they're okay, but you know, just take a glance. And these ones over here, you definitely need to fix these. And uh, that kind of goes back to the source of having decent data to start doing those models upon in the first place. But uh, uh, it's so easy to do that kind of thing to uh, to data because that's really what Gen AI was really kind of built around, um, just cleaning up and sorting out uh, sorting out data so your data is constantly one hundred percent. It solves so many downstream problems. It's amazing. Wow. Yeah, I, I think it's been a big relief for companies that um, large investments in master data management. Have kind of been curbed by the by this use of machine learning and these other tools. Uh, to Bill's point, to watch your data, to be more in a metadata world instead of having to store golden records, et cetera. It's, it's really been quite an advance to make sure you have good usable data coming in and out of your system. Yep. Yep. Okay, so we've talked about we alluded to some of the systems that exist within a warehouse, and I'm just wondering, based on this whole discussion of this massive volumes of data. What kind of systems or software is needed to run these types of simulations? It would seem to me that that would require a ton of processing power. Joe? Yeah, it can seem that way, right? And when you when you go online and research Digital Twin, you look at the video and these people running large factories and you're thinking, wow, all the data that comes in, these big computers are just cranking away. Um, for a starting point, though, Really, you'll, you'll find most, most companies have a good set of transactional data every day coming out of their WMAS and their WCS uh, systems. They've got it stored somewhere where it's accessible. And then you can start applying these AI tools against it, which could just be a BA, a user on a notebook with a, on a laptop with a Jupyter notebook and some Python tools running some predictive analytics on dock door availability or some aspect of your warehouse. That's how it can start. Now, if you're now if you're if you're already uh, on part of a you already have a cloud provider like AWS or Azure or somebody like that, they have some more ready to make tools around digital twin. Twin Maker Azure has a has a, a digital twin suite, and then you can start getting into that cloud environment. And of course, those will those will scale with you. But but one thing to remember, how you approach these projects. It was mentioned earlier. You have to be careful of overwhelming your your project with data. You got to be ju judicious about your data. You got to use edge computing to make sure you don't always have to go out the cloud to do a calculation. You have to be smart about it. But of course, when you add three D modeling and these visualizations, that that would make sense. That would add more compute and more complexity to your to your technical solution. But you take it from an ROI perspective. And you scale as you go, just like you would with any kind of analytics. If the analytics uh, and the results you get from it pay for itself, then you scale with it. But you got to be smart about it. And again, that those are some of the things to watch as you get into digital twin is how you will grow it, how you will scale it, how you'll manage your cloud transaction fees, et cetera, and how much edge computing you, you'll adopt to try to mitigate some of that. It's a great point. Yeah. yeah. Bill, you have to model you the cost. You have yeah. to model the cost. I mean, 
when when you look at when you look at uh, machine learning, digital twin, Gen AI, and all these things, there's an assumption that there's uh, infinite compute out there. You have to be careful of those consumptions because they come mm -hmm. at a cost. Yeah, so you have to model as part of your future plan just how big it's going to go. But don't be um, intimidated by getting started. And the other thing is, cloud providers know, and they're and they want you to get started. So there's a lot of incentives out there, and a lot of uh, a lot of price breaks they'll give you to get going. And then that that's a great point, Joe, that you make because oftentimes we've seen with our clients that. Uh, you know, digital twin sometimes seems to be a much bigger undertaking than it is because when you say digital twin, now it's sort of left to the imagination of, you know, the person that what, what kind of digital twin are we talking about and perhaps starting small, starting slow, you know, again, that, that static sort of a digital twin, which might even be called a, a, a simple dashboard to begin with, might be the beginning of your journey rather than going all out on the sensors and the cameras and, and all the fancy um, software. So I, I guess that's 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 a great point that you know, start small, start slow, but start. That's a great reminder, Pranav. Uh, a digital twin, again, it's, it's more data than you've had before. So a lot of the first steps is just a dashboard. I'm just looking at more data points and now then I'll figure out what to do with them. Yeah, th I, thanks I, for reminding me of that. Yeah, it's a great no, starting I think, point. I think the other thing, guys, that we should re remind our, our audience is that Increasingly, there are systems that provide these things core in the in the solution, and you need you know they may be limited in the data they that they only have within their system, but the visualizations are changing nowadays. You're starting to see three D three D heat maps and things like that in the WMS, which allows you to kind of visualize the the warehouse in a in a three dimensional digital way, and I think that um, increasingly. Uh, customers are expecting uh, that kind of technology to be available. And if that's the case, then then uh, you may already have it. You may already have these kind of technologies available to you, either in your core WMS or core supply chain management system or in some kind of uh, um, uh, BI tool that you're already taking advantage of, that you're already yeah. using. Yeah. Well, thanks, guys, for helping to reduce the intimidation factor, because as we say, you know, that just seems like the sparkling new technology seems overwhelming in its implications and its applications. This is great advice for people who might feel like, you know, where do I even, you know, how do I even get my arms around this in the first place? But, you know, largely, I know we were talking about devices, obviously, but we're also talking a lot here about software up to this point, software and systems. Modex 2024 is just around the corner. And automation and AI are going to be hot topics there in Atlanta. I'm wondering in which ways can digital twins and AI be used with or for all that type of new fangled warehouse automation? Pranav, what's your view on that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I guess, uh, Bob, the, the answer is not, not that straightforward. It's almost as... Uh, you know, someone asking me, what, what do you use your iPhone for? You, you, you can use it for a lot of yeah. things. Um, at the end of the day, it really comes down to what the business wants. And you know, we, we've got a smart factory in Montreal where we have all of the digital twin and AI use cases laid out. So I would encourage uh, people watching this and, and our potential clients to have a look at it. Uh, but, but some of the things that we have there, uh, you know, it includes, and, and these are real world problems that we've heard from our clients, um, it includes damage detection. So you've mounted cameras at your um, dock doors, um, both at your entry and exit points to see if the merchandise that you're receiving, is it damaged or not? Um, you can also use it to count the number of boxes you have on your pallet and just, you know, do, do some sort of blind receiving without actually having a person there. Um, so you can go from there to, you know, other, other issues that we've seen with certain vendors being fined because um, their their pallets don't conform to the standards of um, their their end clients. So so you could use camera vision technology for that. Um, there's also safety use cases just to model out whether um, you know the, the people the labor in the warehouse is walking within the safe zones or or there's been some sort of uh, entry into the areas where forklifts um, operate. So these are more on the operational or the people aspect of of a warehouse. Um, you can have the space digital twin, which will help you optimize your layout, optimize inventory management, uh, provide real-time tracking, real-time monitoring of your equipment, uh, your conveyor belts and carousals, 
uh, or any other digital equipment that's that's in the warehouse. Um, all all of these technologies are out there, and, and I'm, I'm sure Modex is going to have a plethora of um, you know vendors and providers who specialize in providing uh, both the equipment and and the software for it. And obviously, Dexis um, is is probably mm -hmm. one of the most leading providers of such softwares um, globally. But at at the end of the day, again, it it comes down to you know picture battles. Is it uh, you know going to be increased efficiency? Then you have a separate set of digital twin uh, for that. Or if it's mm -hmm. uh, risk mitigation, that's now completely different territory. Mm -hmm. And then um, Bill already called out if it's around data driven decision making, and then am I going to cleanse data? Then you're looking at different type of uh, a digital twin and AI for that. And and mm -hmm. I think the answer is. Um, you know, what's fit for purpose for yourself. Certain cases, maybe it's you know, something out of the box. They've done it 10 times before. Um, in certain cases, it might make sense to perhaps customize something for your own business, especially if it's a very large enterprise that, that has its own unique business model and business challenges. So I think mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a multitude of all of those things, but generally it would be around space, labor, and inventory. Those are the three big themes when it comes to uh, digital twins um, and AI in warehouses. Okay, thanks very much for that. Thanks. Um, I'm sorry. Thoughts? Yeah, I, I, I would really like to bring in the audience for this one, though, uh, if that's okay. We have a lot of really good audience questions, and we've got these experts here, and I'd like to take advantage of your expertise to help them better understand this topic. So if that's okay with you guys, maybe we can move into the uh, audience Q&A session at this point. Um, okay, here's a question. Um, I think this might be best for Pranav. Uh, the question is, can we consider SaaS-based shipment tracking, that software as a service-based shipment tracking software as digital twins, where it fetches data from containers and ships as they physically travel, and it also gives predictive value if it will be delayed or will be on time? You under, you uh, get, great, what do you great think? Great question, Bob. I guess uh, I, I would revert back to the idea of, um, you know, Am I synchronizing it? Am I simulating it? And am I visualizing it? Um, in this case, it seems like it could be a very, very early variant of a, of a digital twin, but not quite so because there are no simulation capabilities. I don't know that what's going to happen if uh, you know there's there's a blockage in the Suez Canal or the Panama Canal, or if um, there's um, inconsistent weather conditions. So that simulation capability is lacking. Um, I also don't think it's it's very live. It's contingent to someone actually inputting the data as to where your shipment is at any given point of time. So with that in mind, I would say that it's primarily a dashboard, but if you integrated it with a few more capabilities, more specifically simulation, then that's going into the digital print territory. Okay, thank you. Uh, this questioner says, relating to Bill's IoT comment, how important is it to have a so-called smart warehouse to take advantage of the digital twin promise? Well, well smart warehouses, is that's a term that was, uh, well, I mean, I work for marketing, so it probably came out of a marketing department. So um, <laughs> sure, it's a real, real thing. But the, the criticality of it is, yes, if you are running a, a warehouse system from 20 years ago, your chances that it's got inbuilt um, you know, virtual visualization, simulation, zero, absolutely zero. Uh, if you're running a, a, a modern uh, a continuous delivery type of uh, WS so that's updated on a regular basis, I can almost guarantee if it's not there yet, it's going to be on the roadmap to be there in the next few couple of years. So running a smart warehouse, um, which might be sort of like running kind of the uh, the the you know, highly automated warehouse, all that really changes is the prefer is the amount of data you have. When you're running a very highly automated warehouse, you have just an absolute boatload of data. Whereas if you're running a more manual warehouse, your data is 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 less is less so from the actual systems you already have in place. But if you are just running a regular WMS, you can augment that data with, with sensors and other sources of data, which you can then combine into the WMS. So I guess the true answer is it, you don't really need to have a, you know, a, a fully highly automated warehouse to, uh, to, uh, to, to be able to model. And 
because you can augment whatever you need with 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 other sensors. And the other the other aspect to it is that the the smart warehouses are getting smarter really fast. So uh, you you're going to see you're going to see this stuff in in core systems very soon. Wow, interesting. Uh, this question here is, is referencing our poll, I think, uh, asking, based on the results of that survey, what barriers do you think companies face to implement digital twinning and AI for warehouse optimization? And uh, we want, Joe, you're nodding. You yeah, want to... yeah I, I feel it is. I, I feel it's understanding the use cases, right? It, it's kind of bringing it down to earth. I think we've talked about this a couple of times, is that digital twin is not such a daunting concept. We've been using input variables to predict what's going to happen for labor, you know, on spreadsheets for years. We, we've been doing that all kinds. Digital twin is just that next level of data, which then allows you to kick in these AI tools that can you that can look at multiple variables at one time and in, in a very fast way make sense of those variables and correlate them. So it's really pulling back the covers on it and, and understanding you don't need to know all that's happening inside the black box of machine learning, et cetera, but just know that you can put in more data, you can model more quickly, it can understand relationships between data points and it can get to work for you. It's basically like a very smart electronic supervisor. It's watching your operation and making some quick calculations on what to, what to adjust and just kind of humanizing the whole digital thing. And as we do that, we find the use cases really start to pop out. Once people connect that, what really what it is, the use cases just kind of naturally flow. It just takes a while to sort of orient people towards it. Thank that, you. That's really what's in the way of adoption is more education sessions like this, which just kind of yeah. brings it down to earth. Yep. Well, we've got some really great audience questions here. Uh, this one says, how do you see the role of human workers evolving? Um, with the uh, with the implementation of digital twinning and AI, and what measures can organizations take to ensure a positive transition for their warehouse employees? Uh, Pranav, I haven't heard. Uh, you want to you want to take a stab at that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And this is something that that's very close to me because I've been a big um, advocate of uh, making sure that the change happens with the the people who are going to be affected rather than to because that's how you actually get uh, the, the buy-in. And I think there has to be a certain upskilling of the workforce as, as we are going forward uh, with the march um, into, the, into an autonomous future. And you know, perhaps we, we need to also understand uh, that, that with the increase in efficiency, there perhaps might be um, you know, either transitioning of certain roles or maybe elimination of certain roles. And, that can be um, guarded for against by um, increasing the efficiency of your business, increasing the volume, increasing the outputs, um, and and retraining your workforce um, so that they are actually change agents and and you know they are the people developing your business into that direction rather than um, you know just just um, just just focusing on external vendors coming in and and doing something to your business and. You know, for, for us at, at Deloitte, we've been big believers of uh, enabling our clients to go through that journey themselves rather than, you know, being there all the time uh, for that journey. I think true value lies in, in unlocking that value that um, our clients can actually bring to themselves. Um, so I think retraining um, is going to be a big, big aspect of, uh, of, um, of, of digital twins and AI, not, not only in, in warehouses, but pretty much everywhere. Uh, the answer is to just learn what's what's going on around us. Yeah, I think I, I just like go ahead. To add to that, um, we had a digital twin AI based project at a um, electrical distributor, and it was fascinating because it modeled the warehouse, and it gave the, um, the the distributor the ability to build orders in a way that, um, in the most efficient way possible, but at the same time, which modeled the job sequence that these, these items were gonna get utilized. And it designed and built pick paths based upon the sequence that, that, the, that the components were gonna get consumed on the job site um, in, a, in the most efficient possible way. And it started, and, and honestly, we implemented the system and we spent 25% of the time implementing the system technologically and 75% of the time 
implementing the system with the people. And it was change management and trust. It was building the faith mm -hmm. and just with the floor people. And I think that was the most critical part of this thing. It's a absolute, like this is perhaps a year later. It's a massive success. I, it, um, but there are there are a few things. Am I going to lose my job because of this thing? And we've always done it like this. That can't be right. Those are the two things that you have to not just, you can't just throw the system down and say, well, this is, it's got to be right because the system said that. You've got to, you've got to prove it and build the trust with the people who are actually going to be making the system a success or not. And, the, and that really is that whole change management thing. But it's also empowering the people that are doing the job, giving them a tool to, to be better than they are, but at the same time, giving them a certain amount of uh, ability to tune them, tune their operation and things like that. So I think that the adoption that, uh, that, that was just discussed is, is really, really important, but it's also there's a human capital part of this thing that you can't ignore because they can be the biggest be uh, 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 kind of pushers and, and, and promoters of a system, or they can be the biggest detractors mm. that will basically uh, kill the whole thing. So it's critical that you build that faith and you start small and you build it and build it and grow it and grow it and so on and so forth before you really kind of, uh, you know, say, okay, we're a fully automated system and we're going to trust everything that system says. That's a, that's a very yeah. dangerous thing to do on day one. Well, mm -hmm. the question of humans comes up in every conversation these days about AI and automation. And it's heartening to know that there is a way that you can approach this that incorporates both concern for humans and for your automation and, and, and the like. Um, this this uh, questioner is asking, who is the audience I, of, of digital twinning? It seems they say that this is a desktop display, but does it matter more for the floor operators in terms of a dashboard than it does for leadership? I'm going to throw that at Joe. You I, wanna... I, alluded to, I alluded to what digital twin actually becomes as sort of an augmented AI management and planning tool. So you do, you do push the results out to users if it helps them. Uh, Lowe's has adopted a digital twin so that a store associate can see product at the high levels up on the racks. They know it's up there, but they're not quite sure where it is. So they use a digital twin 3D visualization to help them out on the floor. So it does have, sh have shop floor implications or warehouse floor implications. And it's also a management and planning tool up on a desktop. Somebody who's releasing orders to a warehouse would be using digital twin simulations to optimize the release of those orders based on the current labor conditions and the order profiles. So it, it'll reside in several places. Uh, would it re ever reside in the strategy area? Yep, that's for, that's for a different uh, webinar. Talk about digital twins as, as a strategic tool, but from an execution tool, it is a management planning tool and it will go down to the floor as well. The outputs of it will as well to help people in what we call augmented AI, helps them make better decisions, find okay. inventory they can't find, et cetera. Yep. Well, Bill, one quick, quick comment that you want to make, or no? I I just think okay. that uh, the other aspect to this is don't assume that AI or digital twins have a visual output. They may actually create instructions, and those mm -hmm. instructions may be work tasks or whatever. Yeah. So right. it may not be anywhere near the desktop. It may actually generate activity. So yeah. Right. Okay. Well, this has been a fantastic conversation. I unfortunately am the bearer of bad news, and that is that we were just about out of time. Sadly, uh, we have time for just one final question. I'm going to direct that to Bill. It seems like with digital twins and AI, there are multiple options and possibilities out there to choose from. If you are a supply chain professional looking to get started with digital twin, what can be the first step? That's a great question. I mean, obviously, our survey indicated there is a lot of these kind of people out there, so it's it's very very pertinent. But I think for a supply chain professional venturing into that realm of digital twin, the initial to step is establish a definitive goal. What do you want to solve? What is it you're trying to accomplish? Don't boil the ocean. Find something specific. Is it operational visibility? Is it is it predictive? accuracy, streamlining processes, efficiency, whatever it is, create that goal and, 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 and make sure everyone understands that's the objective of this project. And the other thing I'd recommend for, for, for completely um, uh, new people to digital twins 
is uh, I think I mentioned this earlier, but explore pre-configured digital twin solutions. Look at what's out there that can give you immediate insights with immediate with, with minimal setup. Warehouse uh, systems that have heat maps, uh, BI yeah. tools and BI platforms that offer digital di digital twin visualization. And these tools get you started, get you going and prove some value. So really, whether you're going to take an out-of-the-box approach or build your own from scratch, once you've established a goal, conduct a pilot project, I always recommend start slow, measurable steps, prove the value, get the buy-in, and then build upon that success with, with more success. So that's, that's really what I recommend to someone starting out. Thanks, Bill. And thank you, Bill Denby and Joe Vernon and Pranav Bardwaj for that fantastic presentation. It's really good, good material to help our audiences understand the progress of digital twins. But uh, before we close, I want to tell you about Bagels and Bots. It's happening just prior to the kickoff of Modex 2024 in Atlanta, where Texas is sponsoring a private room for you to find the solution that best fits your needs. This complimentary seminar, including breakfast for attendees, is an opportunity to speak with operations and automation experts and identify the technology that's right for your business. Modex is a huge show, and Texas will help you to shorten the number of vendors you actually need to investigate. That's Tuesday and Wednesday, March 12th and 13th, from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. at the Georgia World Congress Center. There is a Q, uh, there's a code for you to scan if you're able to do that and a URL, but that information will also be provided to all attendees after this presentation. So don't worry about grabbing that if you're unable to do so at this point. Again, thanks everybody for a, for a fascinating conversation on this critical topic. Thank you audience for your great questions. Hope we see you guys at Modex and thank you very much. Take care everybody. See you guys.